but in my heart of hearts, it is a matter of life and death, not only for myself, for my children, my grandchildren, both of the flesh and spirit, but our entire community, not to allow anything that has been used to divide us to win. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the Our Lives Conversation, sponsored by the Black Political Collective. We are so excited that you are joining us tonight for this conversation. I know it's going to be a treat talking about art as resistance. We have some fabulous panelists that are going to share. They are creatives. They are educators. They are Black LGBTQ folks, and they have something amazing to share tonight about the intersection between civic engagement to art and uh, liberation for Black LGBTQ people. Just a couple of announcements before I uh, get into the introductions of who will be with us tonight. If you are watching us tonight and would be so kind to include the hashtag uh, BlackTheVote2020, B-L-A-Q-U-E, the Vote 2020 in your social media posts on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. We would appreciate you letting folks know that you're watching, tweeting out any great quotes that come up that you think uh, are worth sharing. Please do that. Also, we will have a survey that will be posted in the comments section. And so uh, we have a great contest going on right now that you can win a free T-shirt. All you have to do is fill out the survey, share the broadcast, Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Then you can screenshot that and inbox us, and you will be entered into the contest to win a free t-shirt. So please share this all across your social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube uh, at Black Political Collective. And now I would like to introduce our panel uh, that will be talking to with us tonight about art as resistance as a tool of civic engagement and liberation for Black LGBTQ people, particularly in this time of political unrest and uncertainty. We have a fabulous uh, panel up tonight, and I'm going to start with our first panelist, Elise Ambrose, PhD. She is a sexual ethicist, an educator, and a creative. She is a photosonic artist. And she's the founder of Phoenix Spark LLC. She is doing her research around the intersections of race, sexuality, gender, and spirituality. And her most recent photosonic ex exhibition, Spirit in the Dark, Body, Black Queer Expressions of the Immaterial, opened in November of 2019 and continues to be shown around the country. Welcome, Elise. Thank you. Good to be with you. I'd also like to welcome to our panel, Rachel D. Crouch. She is the principal at Perry Street Prep Charter School in Washington, D.C., the award-winning principal there. She has a passion for children, all children, to enjoy basic human rights, which includes healthy food, safe spaces, and high-quality education in order to interrupt cycles of poverty. Rachel is not only an educator, she's also a mixed media artist who specializes in collages and a painter alongside her sister. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Charles Anthony Bryant, a vocalist, instructor, coach, conductor, chorale, leader, extraordinaire. We welcome him tonight with all of his expertise in music and conducting and leading worship uh, in, in various church communities, including at First Corinthian Baptist Church in New York City. Welcome, Charles Anthony. My pleasure. Good to be here. And Dr. Tony McNeil, who's a clinician, a lecturer, a consultant, consultant, and a conductor, and is also a professor of music at Clinton College. Welcome, Dr. Tony. Thank you, Katina. Hello, everybody. And our moderator for the evening is the Reverend Brandon T. Maxwell, who is on staff in leadership at Columbia Theological Seminary in Georgia and is also a fellow with the Black Political Collective. And so he and I have been working closely together on this project since August. And I'm so excited that he is going to be our moderator tonight. He says he's, you know, not a creative in the in a formal sense, but he can, you know, string a tune or two together from time to time. And so he has some great questions and great conversation that he is going to lead with our uh, panelists tonight. So welcome, Brandon. 
Thank you so much, Cantina, my friend. Um, folks, welcome. We're so glad that you've joined us for the uh, next installment here of the Black Political Electives Our Lives webinar series. As Cantina's already said, we have some wonderful artists here with us tonight. You've already heard from them. Um, I've already shared with these folks. I want to give a shout out to Pamela Leitze, Dr. Pamela Leitze, who Valen told me that I was moderating this evening. <laughs> Uh, this is what happens when you miss a meeting or folks make you miss a meeting because I was planning to be there, but I got volunteered I was going to be here tonight, but I'm happy to be here and excited that this is the particular um, event that I've been asked to moderate. So um, without further ado, folks, can we just get started? Absolutely. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> So uh, we, were, we were talking before we started the live stream, and one of the things that I like to highlight is that um, we as artists and creatives and Black folks in the struggle, we're not in this thing alone, right? We're in it together with those of us who are here and those of us who are watching, but our ancestors and our elders are also with us. And so as, we were, as I was preparing for tonight, I started reading some, um, some stuff from our ancestor, our brother, James Baldwin. Um, and this particular quote came to mind. And so I wanna read it to you all now and invite each of you to reflect on it a little bit um, by way of further introduction. The quote says this, the artist is distinguished from all other responsible actors in society. The politicians, legislators, educators, and scientists, by the fact that the artist is their own test tube, their own laboratory, working according to very rigorous rules, however unstated these may be, and cannot allow any consideration to supersede the responsibility to reveal all that they can possibly discover concerning the mystery of the human being. Society must accept some things as real, but the artist must always know that visible reality hides a deeper one and that all our action and achievement rest on things unseen. A society must assume that it is stable, but the artist must know and, the, and they must also let us know that there is nothing stable under heaven. I'm gonna end the quote right there for right now. Uh, I wanna invite uh, Charles. What does that quote bring up for you about the role of the artist in society today? Um, I feel that the artist must be the first partaker of the art. And so what that means for me is that the art can't be art unless it is authentic. And so it must speak to the full reality. And if I am the first partaker of that which I am presenting, it, must, it means that I cannot, I don't have the luxury to see things through a glass. I have to look at it as it is, and I have to make the artwork, and hopefully that art speaks to truth and calls some things forward that may not necessarily be palatable for the larger society just as it is, but I must see it and take it in as it is. And then as it runs through me, it can become more palatable for those around me. That's a good word, Charles. Appreciate you. Um, Rachel, you want to jump in there? Do you mind just repeating the question one more time? Certainly. I mean, so just thinking about that quote from Baldwin, Baldwin and what he offers as um, sort of the role of the artist in contemporary society, you know, the society having to assume that um, things are stable, but the artist has to know um, and has to reveal to others that there's nothing stable under heaven. So just trying to think about um, just from just broadly or thinking about that quote, what is the role of the artist in contemporary society and how do we um, engage in this work of letting folks know that the things that we assume are stable actually aren't as stable as we may think? Good question. So what immediately comes to mind is not my work as a principal, but my work as an artist. And I'm thinking about how most of my friends and people say sometimes my art is too provocative. And I always say like, well, what does that mean to be too provocative, you know? And it's literally because I'm telling truth that nobody wants to see, you know? I'm seeing my art is just singing praises or singing words, singing tunes and no one wants to hear because it may be difficult, right? Um, I recently did a series um, on the Black Panther movement and everything just started to come to light how, you know, how America is still the same. And just highlighting that in my artwork, I think, um, Make people uncomfortable. People are, are uncomfortable with the truth. And as artists, we have to expose the truth and tell the truth and tell our truth. 
So yeah, that's what I would say. Appreciate you. I'm liking this. So the, the notion that art is too provocative. Can you talk a little bit more about that or anybody talk about, you know, as we're revealing truths and sharing those truths as other, with others, what um, is our sort of response or how do we wrestle with the fact that oftentimes those truths we're unearthing or the lack of stability we're trying to portray is named in these negative or pejorative ways. That's too provocative. That's too much nudity. That's too. How do we wrestle with that, friends? I mean, I think we also have to live our truth. I remember um, I painted this painting that said Black Lives Matter on like one part of the painting and someone in my comments said like, why aren't you including everyone? I'm like, because this is about black people. And like, kind of like I said what I said. So like standing in your truth and let people follow as, you know, as they come. And you know, everything isn't for everybody. So the people who follow you and, you know, support you standing in your truth. I mean, I think that's your audience. Appreciate you. Tony, you want to jump in there? Sure. Um, the part that stand, stands out to me in that quote is that responsibility to reveal. Um, and I, that res resonates with me um, as, as a choral musician, as a choral conductor. Um, as I'm preparing um, my choir, uh, the question that I ultimately have to say to myself when I choose any piece what is it that you are trying to convey to people? What is it? What is the story that you want to leave with people? What is it that you want to reveal to people? And so I ask that that question of my students and of my church choirs or any choir that I work with at the end of this experience. What is it that people should take away after they hear us sing this song? Is this just a, a song that we're doing? just to uh, massage our own uh, aesthetic uh, pleasures, something to please us, something to tantalize us individually or collectively as a performing group, or are we here to reveal or proclaim uh, a message or a story? Uh, and so uh, my responsibility as a conductor is to um, empower my singers to be revelators, to reveal the story of the art of, of, uh, in which we are engaged. Uh, and in hopes that whatever it is that we are revealing, the story, the, um, through the dynamics, um, through our facial expressions, um, uh, stage presence and all of that stuff, that people will be led into a deeper experience, one that they could not themselves uh, they could not have experienced by themselves that being in community around this art, that I have come to a deeper understanding of this thing or of this story as a result of, of being in this space with, with these performers, with this audience. Um, and it's not just another song or another um, uh, sonic experience that, that is pleasing to our ears. What, what is there at the end that uh, that we can leave with folk that will change them and make them better people. I just I want to express appreciation um, for you, firstly, Brandon, invoking the ancestor, uh, mm -hmm. James Baldwin and, and the many ancestors that come along with him to invite us into this deeper reflection about what it is to be an artist. And I love what you lifted up, Tony, from, um, from the Baldwin quote about being uh, the artist being a, a revelator, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, and it made me think of um, sort of if the artist takes on this uh, role of being a, a, a revelationary, um, artist, one who has, who is revealing something about reality. I think that they have also, as, as Charles, I think was hitting on, it has already done the work in themselves of revealing mm. something that is authentic to them, has done the excavation, has done the, um, the, the dive into the unknown, into the unseen, as Baldwin points out. And if I can just say, um, I love this invitation that Baldwin offers us to um, note the inherent Black queerness of being an artist uh, that is 
indwelling this liminal space, indwelling this space that is um, uh, indefinable, in this space that is intelligible, this space that is uh, intentionally or unintentionally opaque, and um, that invites us to um, not change the mystery or encounter the unseen and try to um, name it in any particular way or box it in any particular way, but to just sit in the unknown, sit in the unintelligible and learn something from it. And I love that art off affords us that opportunity to um, let it be whatever it is. And, you know, people can take different ideas from it, but really it's about the experience of the art and that internal work of um, excavating and bringing out whatever it is that the art um, yields for you. I want to stay here a little bit longer. If, if does anyone have something to add before I, I want to linger, I want to tarry as the old folk used to say. Um, well, I just want to say one more thing. Come on, Rachel. I was, <laughs> I was thinking about um, just when I was talking about like truth and how not only is it uncomfortable, but on the flip side of that, it's affirming. So mm -hmm. like when you go in black homes and you see James Baldwin on the wall and you see a picture of Basquiat and you see, those are positive images that affirm black people. So it's like James Baldwin said, yes, speak the truth, but he, you know, but it's also affirming truth that makes people feel good. It makes us feel good as collectors and as black people. So I think some of our truth, most of our truth is affirming when you, we put it on a canvas and just period. I think that vibes nicely with what, 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 what was kind of percolating for me. So like as uh, Tony, you were talking and Rachel, even as you were just talking uh, and reflecting again, that this notion of art um, being a way in which our truths are portrayed and shown in, in their affirmations in and of themselves. Um, Tony, I know that, you know, you work with church choirs and, and, and choral groups beyond the church and Charles, I know that you're working as well at First Corinthian Baptist Church and Rachel and um, Elise, I'm assuming y'all got some experiences with black folks in the church. Um, one, of the <laughs> tensions, one of the tensions that I think I've experienced um, as we were doing introductions, y'all you, heard Cantina say, you know, Brandon doesn't identify himself as a creator. I think one of the reasons for that and one of the challenges is I've always, um, I've most frequently, um, express myself and my sort of artistic or creative side in the context of church um, mm -hmm. in black religious spaces. And so it wasn't necessarily that I was being artistic if I'm leading a choir. It wasn't, I'm not being artistic if I'm singing a solo or if I'm acting in the church play. I'm just trying to glorify God because that's the language that was introduced to me. But so I'm wondering about um, this tension that can sometimes exist for queer people and black fo folks more broadly, uh, black queer folks and queer folks and black folks more broadly between the sacred and the secular. Because when I'm reading this quote from Baldwin, um, it sounds a lot like what um, I heard my black uh, uncle and aunt and grandfather talk about their work in ministry, right? When we try to think about ministry, we have to reveal the supernatural. We have to reveal what's behind the scene. Things are not always as they seem. God is working. God is moving. James is not talking, Baldwin isn't talking about that per se, but it has some sort, it resonates with um, with what I hear black church folks talk about they're doing in those spaces. So I'm curious uh, from your vantage points, I guess the question that I'm trying to get towards is as black queer folks um, with different experiences in the church, um, what is the role of, the, uh, of art in helping the sacred or Christian religious folks um, also help them to unearth and live into truth? Does that question make sense? I wanna take a stab at that, Brandon. Um, from a, a, a worship perspective, um, I, the way that I, I approach worship planning and the careful selection of what is said, what is spoken, what is acted out, and even sometimes what people see visually, um, artistically in worship, um, it, it, I, I have to think about this, this cycle um, of revelation and response. Um, but also before you get to response, there has to be some reflection. So in the revelation, which is the proclamation of, uh, of God's, God's narrative, uh, the biblical text, or whatever the song is that you're singing or song is that, that your dancers are dancing to, um, that, that becomes 
the performative act of, of worship. That's the artistic expression of that proclamation. But after that, people, people, we, we need to create a space for people to sit with what has just been, quote unquote, performed. And based on that reflection, from revelation to reflection, comes a response. And sometimes that question is, do I want to be free as a result of engaging with this art? Do I want to embrace the message or the challenge this art just set on me? Uh, and maybe it's a, it's a question of, of introspection uh, for, for, for the person or maybe it's a challenge for the community, for the gathered community, depending on what that text is. And, and so I, when hearing you um, uh, verbalize that question just brought that visual cycle of going from revelation to reflection and from reflection to a response and of whether we'll, you know, we will embrace this as truth. And then what do we do with that truth once we leave, leave the community? How do we walk that out as a result of engaging in that art? May I? Absolutely. I like, to think, <laughs> I like to think of the black church as a whole as an artistic expression. Um, um, of, <laughs> I may get in a little trouble for this, a form of drag, if you will. Mm. The entire thing, <laughs> the entire experience, though we are worshiping God and though we say we are touching God is very performative. From, from the ushers marching, to the choir singing, mm -hmm. to, to the cadences used by preachers, the entire thing is an art form. This is why we know when it's not being done well. Huh. And so, it, 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 and it seeks to bring us to a truth. Now, there are questions as to what that truth may be. There are questions as to the, the truth that we are attempting to get to in church sometimes, but the whole thing, is art and I like looking at it like that because of that aspect of worship. This is this is an art form that is as unto our deity. This is an art form that the, the entire experience is one piece of artwork that mm. is offered up to God at one point in time. And we try to do this and we try this is why you know we we use these terms like excellence and things like that, because that's what we want it to be. We want it to be excellent. We want the art to be excellent. Well, we want our worship to be excellent. And if we want to worship God in excellence, we have to do it in spirit and truth. And so that, that's what that brought up for me. Yeah. Wow. Thank y'all. I'm just making make sure, no, uh, I want to ask Rachel and Elise to reflect on this, maybe in a different way. If you don't have anything that we'll push forward. Um, so if, if you're watching, forgive me. We didn't advertise this as anything about the church. And that was intentional. I'm churchy and I can't help it. I don't like the church. I don't go. I go to bedside Baptist and the cheats of my chill AME. But um, I'm still churchy to my core. But this is not a church conversation, but we just lingered there a little while. But I am curious, um, I guess the flip side of the question and another way to talk about it is that is for me, there's also ways in which um, I, I love the image, Charles, of the church entire entire service being a form of drag. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are ways in which spirituality and the sacred can also be used to obscure and or distract from the beauty of art or from the deeper truths that may exist. Are there ways in which we utilize Christian or religious language and imagery to actually shield us from the depth of truths um, mm. and us from actually going all the way there? So I'm curious from your perspective, Rachel and or Elise, um, anything there for you in terms of um, how perhaps the secular can also illuminate um the sacred space, because I don't like that sort of binary, but how, but what, what can we learn from other spaces and and what ways should we also be critical of what happens inside of church as it relates to artistic expression? At least I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and let you take that um, question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm appreciating that uh, last point about the binary, because I think it is sort of a, um, very Western sort of framing to make this division between the secular and the sacred and that sort of our Afrocentric worldview, but also um, the spirit within us invites us to be whole and to be integrated. And so there is no separation 
of sacred and secular. There is no separation of uh, Megan the Stallion and uh, give me somebody, Tony. Karen Clark, you. Tasha Cops. Thank you. <laughs> there there, there yeah. needn't be any separation because if we yeah. come to the uh, experience as whole people, there's no need for that sort of disintegration. And so I think that in a lot of ways, art invites us to um, have a reason to integrate these pieces mm -hmm. and really um, takes away all of the accoutrements of holiness uh, that we adopt in, in spiritual spaces and allows us the opportunity to, to be more authentic in our relation to what we are experiencing. Because if I, if I say it's art as opposed to liturgy, then already the, the posture has changed. Mm -hmm. But in, in another sort of setting, if, if I'm just engaging with, um, art as um, something that is real, something that is revelatory of some truth, then I think I, I, I fare best and I the collective benefits most if we have in mind our own, our wellness, the totality of our wellness and the wellness of the collective in engaging that art, creating that art, um, doing whatever it is that we might find is fruitful for our, our community with that art. That's good. I into it like when you said integration right after Karen Clark Sheard and Megan the Stallion, I was like, all I can visualize now is Karen Clark Sheard doing the WAP dance. And that's like <laughs> <laughs> probably not helpful, but that's what came to mind. <laughs> we do have a question from Facebook. I want to pull it up really quick. Uh from Dr. Lightsey. It says, I'm thinking of how artists particularly comedians in the 60s, advanced the message of civil rights in front of predominantly white audiences by using language in both prov provocative and subversive ways. Uh, that seems both dangerous and sacrificial career-wise. Do you agree? Anybody want to take a uh, attempt at responding to that? Well, I feel who first comes to mind for me, um, I don't know if it was the 1960s, but I'm thinking of like... Richard Pryor, I'm thinking of, um, oh, my good brother, who, um, <laughs> he's he, uh, Gregory, Dick Gregory, um, in particular, because I know that um, his, his, his comedy was, uh, as, he, as he continued to progress, a bit more edgy um, in a lot of ways. But what I love about um, what they both did and and how um, that what that era invites us to is to sort of do a certain kind of um, not even code switching but a circuit certain kind of language and artistic and aesthetic expression that means something to one group of people and doesn't mean something to another group of people and so our language is coded in that way and I think I take it as a rallying cry I take it as a way of um, calling the collective to a shared experience and a shared memory that everyone in the room can't resonate with. And, that, and that's in the, the tradition of the trickster, Burr Rabbit, et cetera, in, in African-American uh, fables. But I think it's, it's our way. Anybody else wanna jump in there? All right. Thank you, Dr. Lighty, for that question. Um, let's push forward a little bit. Let's 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 uh, take a right turn right quick. Let's let's pull out. Let's get out of this church stuff for a second uh, for a long for, for the rest of the night. It ain't we, I ain't we ain't doing that no more uh, unless it goes there naturally. Um, I want to look at the Baldwin quote and read another portion of it um, that I think invites us to think think about this in a deeper continue thinking about this in a deep way. But before I read the quote, uh, well, I'll read the quote first. Um, the quote says, one cannot possibly build a school, teach a child or drive a car without talking, without taking some things for granted. The artist cannot and must not take anything for granted, but must drive to the heart of every answer mm -hmm. and expose the question the answer hides. Um, when I read this, what I thought about as I'm, so I'm trying to put us in this particular political climate in this season of an election. Um, we got an election less than 30 days away. Um, Joe Biden wants to build back better and has a plan for everything. Uh, well, Liz Warren had a plan, had plans on plans on plans. Uh, 
45 couldn't be bothered to tell us any plans other than we, we, could, we assume his plan continues to be going to kill black people and oppress us and make our lives live in hell. But um, the political climate, I think, in some ways leads us to believe or assume that life is all about answers um, and all about plans and courses of action. Um, but what that can obscure is the reality that sometimes those answers or those plans that politicians offer us are actually designed to obscure um, the questions that lie underneath them that actually may require a, um, a different sort of response or action. So I'm curious, just from your own perspective, as an artist, as an educator, um, as an administrator, um, how do you think about um, that quote in the context of this particular political environment and not taking things for granted and trying to push toward questions? Rachel, what I you think, uh, I was just about to say. So when I think about artists taking things for granted in this political climate, the one thing I think about like every single time is like taking for granted our power. And like my favorite thing to say is like words have power. And then I'm thinking like, but art has power too. And like not taking for granted how much power it has and how art can like move communities, how art can like start movements, how art can end movements. So I think that in this political climate, not taking for granted the fact that our art speaks our truth, it has power, and you know, people are collecting it because they want it on their walls. Once again, I'm back to it being affirming, but I think I, the one thing I will say is that we take for granted how much power our art has. Brendan, I want I want to um kind of continue with uh, what Rachel was saying in terms of affirming the power that our art has. When um, I think about this question, I can't help but think of, of the way uh, my formation as a musician or as an artist was cultivated in this colonized ideology, this colonized aesthetic um, that was set as the barometer for beauty. Uh, and uh, me going through, uh, going to a PWI that cultivated a Western European understanding of what it meant to be a musician, okay? So we had to jump through those hoops, those Western European hoops. You had to learn to Bach, play Bach, Haydn, Mozart. And I'm sure Charles can attest, you know, from the vocal uh, aspect of that. Um, and it, it makes me think about how, um, uh, our training and how these universities and these these colleges have set up that that uh, ideology as as the 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 plateau for for true artistry mm -hmm. and um, and it's caused I can remember uh, myself as I was going through school second guessing the art that I grew up with mm -hmm. and and seeing it less than Haydn and seeing it less than Bach, because this is what's being taught in the school, so it must be important. Um, and so I, I, I don't want us to take for granted that our music, uh, just as Rachel was alluding to, is secondary or is ancillary, um, that it is just as important as Mozart and Bach and Haydn. Uh, and I think a lot of our schools, uh, conservatories and schools of music now are having those hard conversations uh, and facing the realities of, of how oppressive their teaching and their methodologies and their pedag uh, pedag uh, pedagogies have been over the years and how uh, we have been, our music has been pushed to the margins. And so they're struggling now, they're having conversations now of how do we bring in gospel music? How do we bring in some of the music that we've marginalized over the years and told our students, no, don't go over there and don't, don't, don't do that, you know, or do that on your own, or you'll do that, you'll learn gospel or learn pop music after you leave our conservatory, but we won't mess with that now. But now they're they're saying, okay, we need to rethink this and and recenter some of the things that we've pushed aside. Um, and so I, I'm I'm um, I'm encouraged by the conversations that are starting to happen in these national organizations like the American Choral Directors Association, 
and some of these other big, like historically white um, music organizations and them rethinking um, the things that they, they require uh, our music majors and artists to do uh, before they graduate. And so um, our music has value in that it, it, it can have its rightful place in that um, a curriculum, in the overall curriculum and the development of future artists. To further what Dr. McNeil just said, I think that we must highlight that there is a difference between specific truths and the whole truth. And I know that oftentimes in, in white spaces, white is right. And oftentimes in black spaces, white still becomes right because mm -hmm. they will still tell you, you must know all of this about white things, whether that thing be music, whether it be visual art, whatever it is, you must know all that is white. But in addition to that knowledge of all that is white, you must know all that is black as well. And there's a wholeness that comes from knowing all of that. Um, likewise, in the political climate, we have people telling us pieces of truths. Everybody seems to be a little bit right. A little bit, even, even if it's just a you know, mustard seed bit of rightness. Everybody seems to be a little bit right. And so if we take all of these pieces, <laughs> perhaps we can get to a greater bit of truth. And we perhaps we can speak to a greater bit of truth and highlight that as opposed to just taking these sections of what mm -hmm. may be right. And this happens artistically. It happens politically. It, hap it happens in every medium where we where we are using these small portions to make something complete. And that's not how that works. Rachel, at least you want to jump in there. Not yet. <laughs> All right. Uh, we do have a question from Facebook. Uh, Angela Sims, I think if this was in response to what, um, well, I think it's in response mostly to what, initially to what uh, Tony, you were saying, and then Charles, I think you expounded on this a little bit, but the question is, what is beauty? I mean, what does it mean to be a musician or an artist? Um, what is beauty? I would I add, based on what you just said, Charles, what is truth? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to be a musician or an artist? And how do um, does that sort of vocation or career um, life as an artist help us get towards beauty and or truth? Well, I will speak from a visual artist standpoint. I would say that an artist literally is someone who paints or expresses their truth through an art form. Someone who, yeah, I would say that someone who expresses their truth through art form. I know, and it adds to beauty automatically, right? Because you paint a painting, you do a still life drawing and you hang it on your walls and you're able to walk by and appreciate it every single day. And I don't think people, people also take that for granted, right? Like being able to just appreciate art and like standing still and listening to the music and just appreciating it. So I would say back to the original question, an artist is someone who speaks their truth through a certain, you know, a different art form, different art forms. It makes me think, um, and I appreciate the question, um, President Dr. Sims, uh, it made me think back to Baldwin's quote, um, really this invitation to destabilization for me, I'll, I'll, I'll address that first part of the question. It's not always a beautiful thing. Truth is not always a beautiful thing. And, and, Oftentimes, I think there's a push, particularly among um, Black Americans, to always create excellence, to always create something that puts, fits, uh, fits a very specific aesthetic of what is Black art. Um, and, and it often holds itself to a, um, a standard that excludes sort of some of those uglier, but also more human aspects of being a um, in this in this life, and so if um, and I think that the same sort of uh, problem follows us in academia or as writers, uh, we're frequently having to write in response to white supremacy, having to write as Black queer people in response to heteronormativity and racism, and and, and our art becomes a response to all the time. And what about 
making um, art that is just an expression of whatever we may feel in the in the moment that isn't um, intended to be uh, quote unquote race art or something intended to uplift the race in a particular way. But haven't we, I think as a people arrived to a place where we can begin to shape the contours of art on our own terms, not by how white supremacy empire dictates to us art ought to be, but that we shape it um, from the spaces that, that uh, the questions that arise from ourselves. One of my favorite people on the planet, um, no longer with us physically, Toni Morrison, um, she uh, approached art making, not taking for granted a white audience. I believe it was either Charlie Rose or um, Moyer. She's doing an interview and, and she's, they, they ask her something about like, when is she gonna start writing about white characters? And, yeah. <laughs> and, her, and her response um, sort of gets at what I'm talking about here that uh, we have a unique opportunity, particularly in the 21st century as black artists to completely disrupt uh, the hegemonic and, and, and hierarchical framework that has told us what art is and to center ourselves. And I think it's important to take that, that opportunity to enter that space of destabilization and see what it has to teach us, see, see what we can create from it, not looking like Baldwin says for these answers and for this beauty and for this perfection and for this black excellence, but just looking for, for truth or whatever might be revealed to us in that moment. I think to that point, all things are subjective. Mm -hmm. So beauty would be something subjective um, or, or how the art is received, of course, is subjective, but it does not take away from the fact that it is truth. It does not take away from the fact that it still stands in its authenticity alone by itself. I love that last line. <laughs> I do as well. I was just checking the Facebook comments over to make sure we hadn't missed anything. Um, I do want to invite us to continue down this path. Um, you, I heard, at least you named Toni Morrison as a, um, an artist who um, destabilizes and decenters and doesn't center sort of um, whiteness and white supremacy in her writing. Who are other artists um, who do that well? Who are some of your sources of inspiration? Artists who um, artists whose work is ex clearly explicitly intentionally political and uh, for the liberation and freedom of black folks, black queer folks, if you got somebody. I want to offer up um, and conjure the name of B. Slade. Um, and especially with the release of his, uh, this newest um, YouTube lyric video called Change. And uh, it is brilliance on steroids. Um, it is it is a piece of art, visually, um, sonically. Uh, he, I mean, he interpolates this um, whole tenor of a preaching hoop on the end, where he's calling out all of these um, uh, these things that uh, that we are facing even in this moment now. Uh, he's always been uh, on the cutting edge in terms of things that, uh, uh, that he, he speaks about uh, and, and things that we are dealing with, especially at uh, people uh, that are members of the queer community. He himself being um, uh, uh, ostracized by the church for being queer, uh, he has a lot to say. And anytime he comes out with a track or a video, I'm there to listen because a lot of times he articulates the things that a lot of us who serve in churches, um, especially those of us who serve as out queer folk in, in churches that may not necessarily be welcoming and affirming, but we are yet present. Uh, but he gives vocabulary to all of the frustrations and all of the angst that we, we bump into every week that when we enter these spaces. So I'm grateful for his ministry, his witness, his audacity, his bluntness, uh, he can praise God and cuss all at the same time in the same song. And that's, for me, real. That's life. Um, he, the best of us, that Bible toting, going to Sunday school, sometimes we have to say what we have to say. 
And I've, I have colleagues who say cussing is a holy language. And so I, I'm grateful for the ministry of Be Slave. I'm going to lift the name um, Durand Bernard. Um, he is a lesser known artist out of um, Los Angeles, but he is on the rise. He used to sing background for Erica Badu. He recently released a CD and he is pushing so many boundaries for queer artists right now. He, he, he presents whoever he feels he is that evening on stage and the boy sings down. His writing speaks to everything, just everything that we go through as black queer people. And, and so I just want to lift that name in, in, in the space. And I would like to lift Roger Carter's name into the space. Um, he is an artist in Chicago. He paints beautiful um, photos of James Baldwin, but then he does it with G.I. Joe soldiers. So his, all of his art is out of G.I. Joe's. And he's making them into faces of Asada Shakur and all of the greats. So I want to lift his name up. He's up and coming, but his work is beautiful. I would um, lift up the name Micheline Thomas, a pretty, I think, well-known um, Black queer woman artist, uh, visual artist, frequently remakes some of the classical, um, classical art pieces um, centering Black women, centering Black folks, and I think really turns the gaze um, of, sort of, of, of art history in a way by, by reorienting where um, the story ends and begins. And on top of that, I, I would also, for this moment, lift up artists that you might not be able to find if you Google, so like they wouldn't be the first people who came up. I'm thinking about people that that I know, um, Jim and I, who's an artist out in North Carolina, Story Michelle, an artist in New, in New York City, black queer women artists, black non-binary artists. I mean, uh, there's so many people who are doing extraordinary work that you can see on Instagram now, um, maybe maybe having access to this art that you weren't able to see before, um, before we sort of had this digital arena to lift up art. And I think I want to highlight the ways that dig digital media has democratized art. And so you don't have to go to a museum to see art. You don't have to go to a gallery and hear the gallery owner's opinion about who's important in visual art <laughs> or the museum's idea, the curator's idea of who's important in visual art. Uh, we have right before us in our communities, artists who are doing amazing work that is groundbreaking, that centers black liberation in a way that um, maybe some artists haven't been able to because they're being funded by who, um, people who can direct their art in a particular kind of way. So I think that the grassroots, uh, people that we don't know just yet, uh, provide really fruitful space for us for thinking about who, who's uh, speaking to Black liberation at this time. I love all of those names. Uh, so we're, folks that are watching, we're gonna get these names to you. We're gonna jot them down and make sure that they're in the comments so that you can go look them up because every person they name um, can be a source of inspiration for you as well, for all of us in this particular political season and climate. Um, and you, so at least you started talking about censorship and funding. Um, somebody that came to mind as y'all were talking was Misha Green, who's one of the writers with Lovecraft Country um, that's on HBO right now that's doing some really beautiful work, black sci-fi, type uh, stuff that I love. Um, but I'm curious, um, in terms of this current election, um, the, the one that's coming up on in, right here in a few days, a couple of weeks, um, what's at stake for us as Black folks, Black queer folks, and Black queer folks who are artists? Um, and if you're able to, I mean, so I think it's like for the folks that you just named, that we just named and lifted into the space, um, what might they represent as like something that's at stake for us? Like if we look at B. Slade's artistry, if we look at Duran, Duran's artistry, um, what's at stake for us as a black queer artist in this election? Um, if Trump is reelected or if Joe Biden wins? Okay. 
I guess my concern, um, and not a concern, but more so what Elise was talking about, and I was literally over, I've been over here thinking about it since how she was talking about how basically white supremacy, white privilege, racism drives our artwork. And so I'm thinking about if Trump gets elected again, we'll have a whole new set of art pieces that are related to Trump and his election and not really art pieces that are related to us. Um, Cause I know like the Trump election and black, like that's our truth too. But if we spend, I wonder if we spend a lot of time during all of the political pieces, like when do we get back to the pieces that mean something to us? Like the Romeo Bearden's and the Charlie Palmer's that speak to us and have nothing to do with, you know, black politics, racism, white privilege, and it's just beauty and art. Yeah. Um, I was reluctant to say this. I think that there is a level of erasure that we will be looking at if Trump gets elected again. Um, a high level of erasure because you're talking about different freedoms that are now being taken away from us and we will not be able to move in the way that we generally move. And it will become something that has to, I, I honestly feel this. I really feel this. And I, there are some that may say I'm going a bit too far in my thought, but I feel that many things will have to become, you know, underground movements if Trump mm -hmm. is elected again, because there are people who are talking about war. They are talking about a race war that they want to see. And it's a very frightening prospect, but I think it's very real. Brendan, I'm concerned uh, about public school arts education um, that is already at risk. And um, I, I'm, I'm in this space of thinking now, and I know we said we we're not going to talk about it, of, of, of what are the alternative platforms for delivering arts education to our, to our children? Um, should they be removed from the public, uh, public schools uh, venue? And the only other place I, 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 that comes to mind, or the first place that comes to mind for me is the church. Mm -hmm. And do we have uh, pastors and music ministers and creatives who are already in these spaces who are willing to uh, reimagine what it means to deliver music ministry or arts ministry so that it stretches beyond the borders of just your choirs and your band and your praise team, but um, ministry that uh, means, you know, we offer private lessons uh, and some churches are already doing this. But um, for those that aren't, um, that we, that, that the church may be the institution to pick up the slack where uh, the public schools aren't able to, to carry anymore. And, uh, and I hope those conversations um, are emerging or are starting or continuing uh, in our churches and uh, with our pastors, if those uh, that are watching, uh, will please consider what small thing that you may be able to do to contribute to the ongoing work of arts education. Because for a lot of our, our children, uh, and I know for me, um, arts education is where I was introduced to my soul, and where I met my spirit, my heart. Um, and, uh, you know, going to Mrs. Rue's house for a piano lesson uh, or, you know, having band and being exposed to drama and dance and all of that stuff. It not only cultivated my soul and my spirit, but it also affirmed my, me being queer. And that's where I, I was affirmed and, and knew who I was because my art um, undergirded and reminded me of that and being able to engage in those art artistic experiences, both at church and school, um, served as a reminder of who I was and why I was here. That's good. Rachel, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about you as a principal at a mm -hmm. charter. Does any of that resonate with you? So, you know, I'm sitting back and I'm listening, I'm listening. And so he said public school. 
And so that makes a huge difference because I'm at a charter school and I control the budget. So, you know, we have art and you know, we have music and you know, we have theater arts and you know, so we have everything. <laughs> so we plan for all of those classes, right? So, um, but I do understand in public school, it looks a little different, but I do believe that if they take um, arts education out of public schools, it is going to take the community to supplement. Mm -hmm. And a large part of the black community is tied to the black church. So I agree, Tony, wholeheartedly that um, the black church is gonna have to step up first and start providing those art classes and providing plays and things that kids can do for extracurricular activities. Um, and I'm not a pastor and I don't run a church bu budget, so I don't want, you know, and I don't know how many people and bodies you need in order to pull that off. <laughs> but, but I do think that's where we need to start. Brenda, when you, um, when you initially posed the question, um, sort of, of, of what's at stake, if, you know, the unthinkable happens. I was, um, I was reflecting on um, just the last several years and um, Betsy DeVos and, and decisions that she has made related to, to education in general and her general um, lack of knowledge about education, it seems. And, and I also thought about um, sort of my own teaching experience within um, a, a, a very well-funded private school in, in New York City versus what I knew many other children were experiencing in, in public schools and things of that nature. And I, I, I started to, I guess, wonder when we asked the question of, of what's at stake, it sort of rests upon a presupposition that those systems at some point served black people well, and now they don't. Mm -hmm. And I don't exactly follow that truth um, I, I, or, or that idea. I find that um, it's, an, it's, I have no way of saying it, but that it's an authoritarian sort of power that directs every system that is, is functional in the United States. And so if that authoritarian power is at work, even in education and only wants to create children who sit behind desks and sit still and don't say nothing or you or else you put them on medicine. Um, if it only wants to create bodies uh, for adults that, you know, uh, people who are sterilized, people who are incarcerated, if it only wants to create what Foucault called docile bodies, I don't expect anything good, anything liberating, anything that leads, leads to healing and wholeness to come from that system. I think back to when I was a child, my, when I was three, my brother was five, he taught me the planets. I didn't know what a planet was, but when he taught them to me, I drew them almost every day. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Okay, that was my first artwork. And it occurs to me that, what, you know, I don't know that it was a liberative practice of some sort or that there was something that was transformative about that for me, but it did allow me to dream different worlds. And it reminded me of the responsibility we have to one another to invite one another to dream different worlds and that we hold that for one another and that it won't come from outside of us. Certainly not the government. Mm -hmm. Well, that is such a good point about like just dreaming different worlds. Um, just being a principal in a Title I school, that means 90% of your kids are um, low income or receive free or reduced lunch. And not having grown up like that and what I was exposed to versus what my kids are exposed to is completely different. Like art shapes you, you know, taking art classes and taking new classes, it shapes who you are. And it's like, if our kids aren't exposed to those classes and those things, it's like who is shaping them or what is shaping them? Um, so I completely agree with what you're saying, Elise. Friends, I'm so, so grateful for your time, your energy, and the wisdom that you've all shared tonight. Um, I'm grateful for where we have where we started and where we ended, as is often the case with um, our Black Political Collective events. Um, right when it starts getting good is the moment that <laughs> it's time for us to go, but we do want to honor your time. 
Um, and so I guess one thing that I would say to everyone who's watching is um, what we hope you've experienced tonight um, and what you've witnessed is a little bit of the joy we've all had in talking about art and the ways that that's made manifest in our life. And we're not, we, we haven't attempted or our intent isn't to end on a somber note and to end saying, oh my God, all these things are gonna happen. Because the reality is, as Elise pointed out, um, and as I, I see a comment from Elizabeth Ann Jefferson, whether Trump wins or whether Biden wins, things are still at stake. Mm -hmm. Whiteness is still going to be real. Capitalism is still going to be real. Heteronormativity is still going to be real. And so we don't by any means want to suggest that the election is an end in and of itself. Um, but we, what we do want to highlight is that the election is one type of political action. Voting is one type of political action that is necessary and is helpful. And But regardless of what happens on November the 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, however long it takes them to count the votes and however long Trump wants to act crazy, work is still going to be necessary. Art is still going to be essential. And it's going to be a source of political resistance, joy, and a way that we affirm ourselves. So hopefully you've learned something tonight if nothing else, then just an artist, somebody that you can go listen to on Spotify, somebody's art you can go um, try to find on the internet or at a local art gallery. Um, I wanna give thanks for each of you once again. If, I wish we were uh, in public so there could be like hand claps. I, we need to figure out how to get some digital hand claps going on in the background and some, oh, some cheers. Um, but thank you so much for the wisdom each of you has imparted. Thank you for joining us on Facebook and on YouTube. I do want to let you all know that we do have another installment of the Our Lives webinar series coming up in the next two weeks. The next one is going to be called Our Lives, Our Elders Speak the, uh, the Black LGBTQ community. And it's going to be featuring Mandy Car Carter, Reverend Cedric Harmon, uh, the senior bishop Zachary Jones, Reverend Dr. William Knight, Reverend Louis J. Mitchell, Doctor and Dr. Wilhelmina Perry. And we are looking forward to that. And the Reverend Victoria L. Burson will be the moderator of that event. So we hope that you'll tune in. Um, as a reminder, we have that T-shirt giveaway going on. If you want to win a free T-shirt, a Black the Vote T-shirt, and the T-shirt is hot, y'all. I got mine in the mail the other day. Go ahead and uh, fill out the survey. That The link is in the comments on Facebook. Share this broadcast. Follow us on every social media channel, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, screenshot it and inbox us on any social social media platform and you'll be entered in a drawing to win one of our Black the Vote t-shirts. Um, in closing, I've been saying this to my students here at Columbia and elsewhere, have a voting plan. <laughs> have a voting plan and execute mm -hmm. that voting plan. If you've planned to mail in your ballot, do it now. Don't forget to do it. If you've planned to go vote in person, I encourage you to take seriously the fact that a pandemic is happening and to figure out the safest way for you and your family and your friends to vote. If that means voting early, know the dates, go do it. Early voting starts next weekend, Georgia. I'm going early. Me and my husband are going early to stand in line together. We're going to wear our little N95 mask and we're going to vote. If you wait till November the 3rd, if you stand in line, if you're in line before the polls close, you need to stay in line. They cannot turn you away. You are entitled to vote on that day. Stand in line as long as it takes and vote, 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 vote. And uh, don't view that as an end. If you haven't been politically active before, let that be a beginning to your political action in the future. Pick up a paintbrush, sit down at a piano, or just turn to your neighbor and show them some love. All of those things are ways that you can continue your political action. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see y'all in a couple of weeks. Thanks again to our panelists. The majority of the people that I serve are the uh, antithesis of what the current administration supports. There's multiple people leading across the country and there's multiple actions happening all the time and these constant disruptions and that's what we need. And we can only prevail when we are persistent beyond the mechanism of the vote.